Welcome everyone. My name is Kaliro Istavrianu, and on behalf of Global Clinical Engineering Alliance, I'm very happy to moderate this series of webinars that aim to educate, promote collaboration, and also promote information exchange about healthcare technology, engineering, and patients' outcomes. All our webinars are recorded, archived, and also live streamed on Facebook. Following the completion of the webinar, the recording material will be accessible on our website www.globalcea.org. Please note that at the bottom of the screen, you have a Q&A button where you can submit questions to the faculty, and those questions will be addressed towards the end of the webinar or through a report in our website. In addition for posting general comments, there is the option of the chat box for audience interaction. Today's webinar is the eighth in the series with a title, Safety and Quality of Medical Equipment, Global Clinical Engineering Perspectives. Now I'm very pleased to give the floor to the webinar's moderator, Stefano Bergamasco, member of Italian Clinical Engineers Association, GCA Founder Council member, and director at MedTech Projects. Stefano, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Carly Roy, and thanks uh, to all uh, the, the people that are following this webinar. We had an amazing attendance in terms of registrants, so we are really, really happy of this. First of all, I would like to address my opening thank you to the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance that is organizing this series uh, of webinars, and a special thank you to Professor uh, Said Khalil, who is leading the Education uh, Committee. We are trying our best to provide with the valuable content, and I really think that also today's webinar will be very much uh, useful and uh, full of uh, interesting, interesting content. Uh, my thank you right now to the uh, speakers uh, that I will introduce uh, in very in, in just a minute. I would like just to say a few words about, about this webinar uh, that I think that is uh, covering a topic of uh, special interest. The title that is Safety and Quality of Medical Equipment, Global Clinical Engineering Perspectives, uh, is talking of uh, something that is at the cornerstone of uh, clinical engineering practice, safety and quality. Safety and quality are really key words for our profession. And I think that bringing this topic that are so much well established and discussed, but bring it back to the center of the discussion, I think is really important. Just uh, three points uh, uh, about the key elements of, of this webinar. First of all, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, listen to a global approach. We will have speakers uh, from uh, Canada, Kevin Taylor, that I really thank very much, from Japan, Keiko Fukuta, and from India, Niranjan Kandete. So we will be covering covering the, the globe. We were kind of joking before opening the, the webinar. Shall we say good morning, good afternoon, good night? This is really an indicator of how global our profession is and how important it is the organization of this kind of, uh, of events uh, for the global community of clinical engineers. Uh, the second point that I would like to mention is that we are talking of these keywords, safety and quality, and we can be focusing on safety and quality uh, of equipment, of medical equipment, which is, which is key for the activity of clinical engineers, of course. But immediately after that these words, safety and quality, shift to the concept of patient care. So we have to be uh, taking care of uh, medical equipment, but the ultimate goal is patient care. So we are focusing on safety and quality on both medical equipment and patient care. And last point I would like to mention in this brief, introduc brief introduction is that in the presentation that you will be listening, uh, we have uh, different levels to discuss this, this, um, this topic, and we'll be going from the level of government politics, policies and strategies that are very important to empower the, the um, local solutions. And uh, so from this higher level, then we'll go to local approaches, solutions and experiences inside hospitals. So both 
are really important. We are taking care of our day by day activities, but we need a higher umbrella of policies and strategies that are very important. And I'm very glad that in the presentations that I have that I have seen in advance, these topics are very well covered. So I will no longer take take your time. I would like to start introducing the first speaker that is here with us. That is Kevin Taylor from Canada. Just a, a couple of notes to introduce him to the audience. Kevin is the Territorial Manager of Biomedical Engineering for the Northwest Territories, Canada. Uh, Kevin has more than 25 years experience in health technology management, most of which is working in under-resourced and non-standard environments, building health technology management programs. And he has worked and consulted in more than 15 different countries globally. So really, spot on the, the topic and the, the global approach that we're mentioning. 15 minutes for each speaker. We have time for some questions and answers. Kevin, thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you, Global Clinical Engineering Alliance. It is a privilege to have the opportunity to discuss safety and quality initiatives, which the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority and the Department of Health and Social Services for the government of the Northwest Territories have been able to plan and implement in the Canadian North. I am speaking to you from Yellowknife, uh, Northwest Territories, Canada. More specifically, I want to highlight uh, that I am speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Yellowknife Dene on Chief Draghi's territory. Um, to start, I will, uh, you can back up one slide to the background, thank you. Uh, to start, I will give you a bit of context in regards to our unique environment and demographics in the Canadian North. The Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authorities Biomedical Engineering Team supports health technology in all of the government of the Northwest Territories health facilities and two out of the three uh, government and Nunavut health regions. This is a total geographic area of approximately one fifth the United States. The, North, the Northern environment is physically extreme in terms of temperature power and utilities, uh, as well as transport logistics. I should note that during the presentation, I may refer to the Northwest Territories as NWT, and I may refer to the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority as NTHSSA. Next, next slide. As mentioned, the biomedical engineering supports health technology in all of the NWT and also two thirds of Nunavut territory. The two regions supported in Nunavut territory are Kivalik and Katikmiat regions. In the NWT, there are 33 communities ranging in size from a small community with a population of only 40 to Yellowknife, which is the capital city with a huge population of 20,000 people. The total population of the NWT is 45,000 people, which is 51%, 51% of which is indigenous peoples. 40% of the NWT communities are only accessible by plane, as well as barge in the summer or ice roads in the winter. The Kivalik and Katikmiat regions in Nunavut consist of a population of 17,000 people in 12 communities. 86% of this population is Inuit indigenous people. All of the communities in, the, in Nunavut are fly-in only, and only other means of supply is through summer barges. The nor next slide, please. The, the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority is an entity created under the government of the Northwest Territories. It was formed in 2016 when the government merged seven separate health authorities into a single health authority. The, the NTHSSA Biomedical Engineering Program is part of Corporate and Support Services, Informatics and Health Technology Division. It currently consists of a team of one professional engineer as a territorial manager and seven biomedical engineering technologists. The scope of responsibility consists of in-house service support of health technology ranging from pulse oximeters up to and including dialysis, ventilators, anesthesia, and some x-ray technology. Biomedical engineering also budgets for and manages all territorial health technology service contracts in the NWT. Biomedical engineering works closely with the Department of Health and Social Services Health Technology Planning Team. This planning team is part of the Department of, health, Department of Health's Infrastructure Planning Division 
and manages all health technology evergreening for the Northwest Territories. That means planned replacement of equipment. This team consists of one professional engineer who is the manager and three health technology planager, planners. Next slide, please. Uh, the Northwest Territories has a solid health technology management foundation that was initiated in the late 90s, early thousands. In 2018, the biomedical engineering team and the health technology planning team started to jointly identify and address some quality and safety issues that were becoming apparent and impacting healthcare delivery in the Canadian North. I'm going to list some of those. One key element was the lack of communication and information flow between the biomedical engineering team and the health technology planning team. Biomedical engineering had all the real-time health technology information and details, but the health technology planning team at the Department of Health had the mandate to plan and replace the health technology. This information gap was causing prioritization, purchasing, and planning challenges. Part of the lack of communication was tied to the resourcing and the fact that in 2018, there was only one engineer and four technologist positions. In addition, most of the time, one of the technologist positions was vacant. So we were down one quarter of our available staff. Despite the fact that the resources hadn't changed, despite the fact that resources hadn't changed since the early thousands, the health technology, the health technology being supported had dramatically increased in volume and complexity. For example, dialysis machines went from four units in the main hospital to 15 dialysis units in two different communities. Service contracts were also supported separately by regions and departments and individual managers. For example, while one vendor supplied the bulk of the fixed x-ray equipment for the entire territory, the vendor had more than 10 separate service contracts with 10 different terms and conditions and start dates and termination clauses. This made managing contracts extremely difficult to impossible. It was also noted that Nunavut territory had, had support and resource challenges. And even though NWT helped in one region, there was no consistent policies or procedures or information sharing. This led to inconsistent levels of service within the government of Nunavut's health facilities. Due to the lack of resources, one region in Nunavut had no service support for over two years. Finally, a common problem that we all face and has been significant globally is the increasing lack of service manuals and service parts being provided by vendors. So the right to repair. For our isolated and smaller facilities, the inability to service equipment rapidly poses a significant risk to healthcare delivery. So to deal with this, in, the, in 2018, the Department of Health and Health Technology Planning team and the NTHSSA biomedical engineering team started collaborating to address the safety and quality issues. First, we created a territorial health technology management committee that was sanctioned by the executive in both organizations. The committee's primary function is to plan and prioritize all health technology evergreening replacement each year, as well as define the territory wide health technology standards. Biomedic engineering to support that biomedical engineering support uh, completed a full inventory and assessment of all health technology throughout the territory. And in doing that, we essentially doubled the number of health technology assets being tracked in our technology management database. That was the level of gap of information that existed. This territorial database was made fully available to the health technology planners and other executives for planning purposes. We also collaborate, collaborated to recreate the medical equipment replacement score system, which was used to support executive planning as well as Department of Health's evergreening planning and their justification for more funding. For example, we found that we had over $25 million in health technology assets with a replacement value between $5,000 and $50,000 in asset uh, replacement value. These assets had an average lifespan of 11 years. So we required approximately $2 million per year in replacement funding, but we were only receiving $800,000 per year. So it created a gap in our ability to uh, replace equipment in a planned way. We also started loaning resources back and forth between our two teams to meet the territory's priority needs. The benefit of this collabor collaboration became apparent during the planning and the move to a new territorial hospital, which is a huge undertaking that was done in 2019. But that level of collaboration became essential and even more critical during COVID when we had to rapidly plan, purchase, and incoming inspect a large amount of equipment. 
for to give you context on that, we spent the historical annual capital budget for the entire territory in one month. <clears throat> in terms of the of dealing with the lack of service manuals and parts, and the Northwest Territories Health and Social Service Authority created a territorial level policy signed by the CEO requiring the right to repair be integrated into all equipment purchases. The Department of Health turn, in turn implemented many clauses in the procurement templates to align with this requirement. And as of this year, we started to enforce those requirements, <laughs> much to the shock and, of, and distress of major vendors. We have also started to work nationally with other clinical engineers on developing a strategy to implement the right to repair across the country. Next slide, please. Another major initiative was to, to move all service contract budgets under biomedical engineering for the territory. Where feasible, contracts were also consolidated into single agreements. This allowed us allowed some rather significant immediate issues to be noted. For example, one lab company was charging the Northwest Territory $75,000 per year to support four lab devices when the total cost of one device was $55,000 per year. Other vendors were found to be non-compliant with the terms of their contracts. And by canceling these contracts and bringing the work in-house, we not only improve service, we increase staffing. And in one case, we saved $150,000, half the contract value in the first year, even after paying for additional staff. The health technology planning team at the department also worked with biomedical engineering to coordinate service contract terms and conditions during the purchase planning, which has allowed us to leverage vendors uh, uh, negotiations and, and get them to accept key service contract clauses. Finally, the government of Nunavut's biomedical engineering service and the NWT's biomedical engineering service started to partner together. Starting in 2018, we redrafted and aligned all policies and procedures to mirror each other's and not only meet Canadian accreditation standards, but also ensure similar service levels. We created an agreement to share the same health technology management database tool and consequently, we now have full access to each other's health technology data. Then as of April 1st, 2022, we formalized an intergovernmental agreement that has the NWT staff supporting Nunavut in the Kivalik and Katipka region, but also providing clauses to cross support each other. Traditionally, Nunavut had only three techs, although they generally had one vacant position and no professional engineer. Now Nunavut has access to NWT's professional engineer, and we jointly have access to nine technologists in an emergency. We routinely draft, draw down on each other's expertise and experience. Just yesterday, Nunavut's uh, health technology manager called me and was asking if we could cover um, staffing during uh, the summer for one of their staff's vacation. Next slide. Thank you for the time. This uh, it concludes my presentation and I look forward to any questions at the end of the, all the presentations. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Yeah, we will keep the questions for the the end of the of the webinar. I I will adjust a couple of couple of remarks that I, I have uh, seen that you touched uh, uh, some points that seems to be kind of back to the basics. I mean, we are talking safety and quality, and there are some of the things that seem to be taken for granted, but but are not. So policies and procedures, having a good inventory, uh, managing service contracts, these are really key elements for, for quality, quality and safety. And I also appreciated that you mentioned the replacement priority score. And uh, uh, when I happen to see that in congresses or uh, to teach it at university, I always take a slide from the original paper of Fenny Koch, 1992. Uh, just mentioned that, uh, that also in this, uh, we are not talking rocket science, but it's a very, very effective tool dating back 30 years. By the way, this here is 30 years from that publication. And it's very interesting to notice that it's still a relevant concept for quality and safety of, uh, of medical equipment. So thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And we're looking forward for the question and answers at the end of, uh, of the session. Uh, I will now uh, take the screen uh, 
because uh, uh, our next uh, our next speaker uh, Keiko Fukuta due to the time shift she's in Japan so it's uh, late night now she could not be present in person uh, at the webinar but she sent us a video and I will uh, I will share my screen and present it now now to the audience just one second let me just share the screen and share the sound as well uh, just one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, as uh, Kaliroy was uh, was introducing, uh, we have uh, the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance website up and running. We are uh, developing the website, putting more content, and uh, we hope it's uh, you can find it relevant. One thing I would like to highlight to all our our uh, audience today is the web page under resources about the GCEA awards. We really invite you to follow this page. There is now one award uh, uh, listed here, the GCA Collaborative Capacity Building Award, but we are introducing new categories. So stay stay updated keep following this page and submit your candidates for the for our awards we think that this is a very very nice way to recognize uh, to recognize uh, the profession so i will now straightly go to the to the presentation from Keiko Fukuda, I will just to introduce her. Uh, Keiko is specially appointed associate professor at the Medical Center for Translational and Clinical Research, Department of Medical Innovation at the Osaka University Hospital in Japan. She is also international committee member of the Japan Association for Clinical Engineers, and she is a founding member of the Global Clinical Engineering uh, Alliance. Uh, I will now start a video. I just ask uh, maybe Kaliro if you can just uh, mention that everything is fine and you can listen to uh, Keiko. Let's see. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Keiko Fukuda from the Medical Center for Translational and Clinical Research. Sorry. Everything great. Department of Medical Innovation, Osaka University Hospital. I'm a clinical engineer in Japan and a member of Japan Association for Clinical Engineers and the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance. Today, I have the great pleasure of joining this session to present safety and quality control for medical devices at health care facility in Japan. I will present it in two parts. In the first half, it will be related to the government policy and related strategies. The second half, based on those, I will explain how health care facilities manage the safety and the quality of medical devices. Firstly, in accordance with the government policy and strategy, medical device use in medical institutions must be approved under the Pharmaceutical and Medical Device Act. The act guarantees a standard by approving the quality, effectiveness, and safety of the medical devices. It is divided into general control and especially control medical devices according to the classifi classification, which is an international standard correlating to the level of failure. Some of these three categories are designed as medical devices requiring specific maintenance. Medical devices requiring specific maintenance is a medical device that require specialized knowledge and skills for maintenance, inspection, repair, and other functions. If proper management is not performed, it cannot function to diagnose, treat, or prevent diseases. The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare designed this caveat to those medical devices which are deemed 
to have a serious impact on patients. In 2012, approximately 660 kind of non proprietary names were set. Therefore, if those medical devices need to inspect or repair, people who have the design training and certificate can do so to maintain quality and control safety. Safety control. Moreover, maintenance and inspection of medical equipment is stipulated by the Medical Care Act. Within the Act, it is directed that the maintenance and inspection of medical equipment is a duty of the medical institution and must be carried out appropriately by itself. It includes medical devices requiring specific maintenance. Additionally, the notice document by the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare show more specific details about what medical device uh, institute must do. And it was revised and published in 2018. Medical institutes must place a medical device safety manager, train for the safe use of medical devices for employees, plan regular maintenance and implement appropriately, collect safe information related to medical devices and share it to users. The Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare notice paper also status which particular medical devices require training and maintenance, artificial heart lung machines and auxiliary saturation device, ventilator, blood purification device, defibrillator, closed incubator, computer tomography, high energy radiation generator for medical use, such as liner accelerator, medical particle beam irradiation device, medical radiation irradiation device, such as gamma knife, and MRI devices. Moreover, pre-use and post-use checklist for daily maintenance are shown as a sample on the right. Now, let me explain what the medical institutions have been doing based on those government policy. Clinical engineers are assigned too many medical facilities in Japan at the moment. So, and, um, and we ensure the safety and quality of co uh, medical equipment by operating and maintaining them in each hospital by ourselves. We make an inventory sheet on the computer and manage most of medical uh, most of medical devices in the hospital. Nowadays, the number of clinical engineers appointed as a medical device safety manager have been increasing. User training is also required to properly use medical devices. Therefore, we are conducting training for new employees on how to use medical devices and troubleshooting. Also, when we acquire a new device, we request the manufacturer staff to conduct several training sessions for both the clinical engineers and medical staff. This reduces accident for daily use and aim to improve patient safety. About daily inspection, some equipment can be decentralized and stored in the relevant world, whereas other are um, centralized and stored in the clinical engineering office. The medical equipment in the world, which makes up uh, the majority of the equipment, 
is maintained and managed by the users, such as the doctors and nurses. The centralized medical equipment requires high quality inspection and can be limited in number. These must be loaned out to the relevant department or work based on their requirements. Regular maintenance, which does not include the daily maintenance in performed based on an annual plan, which is formulated by the clinical engineers department. The plan is formulated based on medical uh, care act requirement demand from each work, as well as budget constraints. This is an example of what I used to do at the hospital where I worked. Japan Association for Clinical Engineers also published the guideline about regular maintenance as well. Every medical institution has a medical safety department. One of the head nurses is usually in charge of the section. The medical safety department is responsible for overall medical safety in hospital, which includes medicine, employee equipment, and uh, practices. So when clinical engineer receives the safe information related to the medical devices, we share it to them and they share the information to all departments and work. Moreover, the monthly, uh, the department hosts a monthly committee where action and training status of staff members are reported and discussed. It. The medical device safety manager or a head of clinical engineers participate in it and will report the status of medical equipment and training as well. The Medical Safety Committee produces a report which is sent to the executive board. In addition, officer from the government visited the hospital to inspect the facility and handling of medicine in the hospital in accordance with the Medical Care Act. At this time, they check the statement include the status of medical maintenance and the medical uh, management of medical equipment. So clinical engineers are required to show it to government inspectors in written. So within the national medical insurance system, the medical device safety manager management fee is set. The National Medical Insurance System financially incentive medical institution, which prove they are conducting regular training and proper implementation on the safe use of medical devices. The first scheme, 100 points equivalent to 1,000 yen, about 10 bucks, will be paid per month to the medical institution for each patient. The condition is that treatment is performed using a life, side, a life support system, such as an artificial heart lung machine, assisted saturation devices, ventilator, blood purification devices, uh, defibrillator, and closed incubator, to which a clinical engineer is assigned. And the second scheme, 1,100 points, equivalent to 11,000 yen, about 110 bucks, will be paid only once to the medical institution per patient. When radiation therapy has been performed using radiotherapy equipment, such as liner accelerator and gamma knife, these machines must have a safety and quality control system for safe use. It is a supportive system to evaluate safety and quality control and receive financial incentive from the government. So 
the amount is very limited. The, the academic association uh, requests an increase in the amount. In summary, the Japanese government made a measure for the safe use and appropriate uh, quality of medical devices required by health facilities. Moreover, an inspector system is set and incentives are given. In accordance with these policies and strategies, hospitals are obliged to do so for patient safety. Thank you very much for your attention. There we are. I stopped sharing. I can't thank enough uh, Keiko and uh, really a shame that she's not uh, able to be here because her presentation, I think, was really, really impressive. She started from a very interesting point that the quality of uh, equipment starts from the beginning, from a regulatory approval of medical devices. This is really an interesting point, uh, especially here in Europe, just to mention that we are living now a complex transition to new medical device regulations that are affecting uh, uh, the availability of devices and the uh, um, certification process for vendors, and uh, but with the ultimate goal of increasing quality and safety. Uh, another thing I would like to highlight from the many, from the many points that Keiko has touched is that you can have uh, this effectiveness of the programs thanks to different elements. And she mentioned two in particular that I, that I took a note, enforcement. So they have a medical care act, but they enforce it through inspections and incentive how to incentivize the, the vir virtuous uh, um, healthcare structures that have proper programs in place. This is very, very interesting as a general concept that everyone listening to this, to this webinar can take home as uh, uh, suggestions and, and models. Uh, we will now move to the third and last speaker of today, Dr. Niranjan Kambete from, from India, whom I thank very, very much. I would like also for Niranjan to give a brief introduction, but uh, really I, I didn't know where to start, so I made just a selection of the main points. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Kambete is manager of clinical engineering in Kenaka Mangesha Hospital and Research Center in Pune, India, uh, but he has been actively contributing to medical device research and development uh, for the last uh, two decades. So very interesting this point, working both in management and in R&D for medical devices. He also focused his efforts on spreading awareness about the clinical engineering profession and promoting safe use of medical equipment in hospital. And as secretary of the Medical Engineering Society of India, he plans to lead efforts toward the development of a national certification program for clinical engineers. And Niranjan is also a member of the Experts Advisory Committee of WHO on development and technical specification database for medical devices. So really in, uh, interested in uh, listening the perspective from India, great country, very diver diverse, I guess, uh, environments. So Niranjan, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for participating in this webinar. Yes, uh, thank you, Stefano, for that very nice introduction. Uh, uh, thank you, Global Clinical Engineering Alliance and all the colleagues and friends uh, who gave me this opportunity to talk about medical equipment, QA and safety uh, and its clinical perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm going to uh, talk about is basically what is the need of uh, equipment quality and safety, in, uh, what I think uh, triggers this aspect in clinical engineering. Uh, medical safety equipment safety demystified. I have bring out some aspects of medical equipment where the clinicians really appreciate the importance of safety, but maybe sometimes they don't really appreciate to that extent. Uh, then I'm going to cover two representative examples related to the activities of clinical engineers. The first one being the electrical safety 
and we have lot of guidance in terms of standards but then what is the ground reality what is that we are expected to do on the ground uh, and things like that uh, i will move on to performance evaluation or same as quality assurance and i would like to share a representative example the glucometer story and what challenges we face when we have to handle such simple equipment uh, in the clinical context finally i will cover briefly on training and how we would like to empower the frontline clinical staff because without that we are not able to uh, move forward in terms of achieving the required qa and safety next slide please uh in india unfortunately you can see some of the paper newspaper cuttings showing that the equipment has failed and there has been unfortunate deaths of some patients uh this is not such a happy scenario for anybody in india to see more so for a clinical engineering professional where is directly uh, closely related to quality and safety of medical equipment so that's one reason one need why we have to really focus on medical equipment safety and quality next slide please and i have been as, as a part of my role in my previous position in the research and development field i have been a part of some awareness spreading activities and seen some of this kind of equipment in clinical use uh, so that gives us a trigger to think what is really happening in the field so we we do we need to have more clinical engineers do we need to have clinical engineers with better training do we need to have a correct ratio of clinical engineers to technicians all these questions arise when we see uh, such kind of images of clinical equipment in use next slide please and similar situation uh, one comes across when we handled electrical power which is an essential part of medical equipment as clinical engineers we are more responsible for medical equipment than the facilities engineering but then of course we can't keep things isolated so we do see the use of electrical extension boards to supply many clinical equipment in the field and that sounds a bell saying that you know there is something that is not correct in this kind of scenario so these are just some of the representative pictures of various hospitals which we have, have visited uh, across india next slide please so being confronted with this kind of situation as i was introduced i've been involved in creating awareness about what is clinical engineering what is the activities a clinical engineer can really do in a hospital uh, what are the uh, western counterparts of clinical engineers actually doing so we had uh, advanced clinical engineering workshop conducted in 2009 and subsequently many other activities brainstorming session with leaders of health professionals and uh, even some experts from uk like professor alan mare coming and visiting many hospitals uh, across india and giving uh, details about how medical equipment safe use is important so having covered this uh, approach of advocacy uh, i would like to come on to some very basic field level situations in the coming slides next slide please so uh, let me take you through a concept where what is actually the equipment quality assurance and safety so here i show a simple example of surgical scalpel uh, when we think of a surgical scalpel with if we think of its functional requirement it is its sharpness whereas its safety requirement it is sterility and when we give further thought we realize that the sterility part of the surgical scalpel is actually an independent requirement uh, from the functional requirement and if you see the picture on just on the right hand side it's a scalpel which is exposed to the environment so it it is equally sharp but it is unsafe so it can be used it is functionally perfectly okay but it, it is unsafe and that concept that idea is very much in the minds of the clinical professionals so as a part of their training as a part of their understanding of the infection control and it's very obvious that the clinical professionals will never ever use a scalpel which is suspected to be unsterile so and it is unsafe so when it comes to devices such as surgical scalpel the clinical professionals are very much aware of its both needs the functional requirement and the safety requirement 
and they take care of it. Can I have the next slide, please? However, the medical equipment doesn't end with, end with surgical scalpel. We have a wide range of medical equipment, most of them electromedical equipment. And I show a picture of a standard medical equipment, which we all know is the patient monitor or multi-parameter monitor. Uh, so if you try to compare and find out what is the functional requirement, compare this device with the surgical scalpel and find out what is the functional requirement, it is to faithfully monitor various parameters of the patient. Uh, however, its safety requirement, I have listed two requirements here. First, I have highlighted is the electrical safety and second is the calibration and QA. So, as I said in the case of surgical scalpel, safety requirement could be independent and that is also true here in the case of patient monitor where the electrical safety requirement is independent of its functional requirement. One can always say that the calibration is kind of linked with the functional requirement, but the, per, the patient monitor may be perfectly working okay. It is showing some values, but they may not be correct. So uh, one would say that just at looking at the function, uh, patient monitor, one would say it is functionally uh, working okay, but unless you do calibration and QA on this, we can't say that it is safe to use. So this kind of thought process has to be there in the minds of clinical engineers and also the clinical professionals. Uh, in the situations in which we are in countries like India and perhaps some other low resource settings, uh, there is always a question mark whether the clinical professionals are aware of these kind of requirements, especially the safety aspects of it. Can I have the next slide, please? So, Having gone through this kind of uh, challenges, I would like to touch upon the basic activity that most clinical engineers are involved with uh, is the electrical safety testing. Can I have the next slide, please? So we all know that electrical safety testing is guided by an international standard, IC 62353, uh, which is also adopted in India as Indian standard. And what uh, the title of it, this standard says is medical electrical equipment recurrent test and test after repair of medical electrical equipment. So typically we all as clinical engineers do electrical safety testing periodically, either once in six months or once in 12 months. And we all know that the earth bonding, the electrical connection to the earth of the equipment body is one of the essential first in this standard. Unless we fulfill that requirement, there is no point in doing any other test further. Now, is this earth bonding the very basic minimum requirement really holds good when it comes to the situation of this equipment being in clinical use? Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, typically I have seen in many hospitals that when it comes to use of clinical equipment because it is handled, because the three pin plugs are wired on their own, maybe they are not wired as per the correct guidelines, Maybe the manufacturer is not as good as it should be. And then we find that there is always some kind of a compromise or suboptimal earth bonding of the equipment in clinical use. And lack of reliable earth bonding is a real chronic problem. And here I would like to highlight that even if you do electrical safety testing once in six months or once in 12 months, in between there could be a situation where this earth bonding could have got compromised due to low quality three pin plugs. Again, in the low resource setting scenario, perhaps we can't afford very high quality uh, devices to ensure that the earth bonding is equally good. Can I have the next slide, please? So as a clinical engineer on the field, when we experience these kind of scenarios, it would be good to analyze where the things are going wrong. So uh, having seen the use of these three pin plugs, I've seen that the wires get pulled out the earth gets disconnected, but the phase and neutral is still connected. So it is not possible to visually identify that the earth is disconnected, nor the equipment stops working because phase and neutral is supplying power to the equipment. Sometimes in places like India, we have equipment coming from Europe with a European pin top, which has a different kind of earth connection. And then uh, we do are able to plug it inside the Indian socket. So that's another problem which we have encountered. Uh, one more point is the weak retainer clip. The design of the three pin plug, which is very commonly available in India, we have observed that the uh, retainer clip, which holds the cable in place is very weak. 
very weakly, very badly designed. So uh, can I have the next slide, please? So in our experience, we uh, attempted to find a solution uh, and then propagate it. We developed a strong nylon retainer clip using uh, some kind of a very basic uh, material which is used for making cable ties. Then we have changed the uh, securing arrangement by using special nylon knots and bolts so that they don't come out due to vibration. And then we have also added an interlocking cable tie uh, to make sure that in spite of all the tightening, the cable should not slip. Of course, there is some extra length provided to the earthing uh, cable as well as phase and neutral cables. So this, I would like to say, is a simple and cost-effective solution to a chronic earth bonding problem. So even if we test the earth once in six months, we would now feel that the earth will remain secure in between even if the equipment is clinical use. Can I have the next slide, please? So that's actually a way to go about. When we are doing testing of electrical safety, it is good to make sure that the equipment remains electrical safe during its clinical use. Uh, going on to my next story of quality assurance, I would like to bring out the story of glucometer. Can I have the next slide, please? So let us assume a scenario where Clinical engineer gets a call from obstetrics department at 8 p.m. in the evening. So he has already completed his day of work and he gets a call in the second duty at 8 p.m. saying that a neonatal having low blood glucose as shown on glucometer 1 was shifted to neonatal ICU because it was having low blood glucose. On the other hand, inside a neonatal ICU, the glucometer 2 showed normal blood glucose for the same patient. So the question arises here is that, was there a real need to shift the neonate to ICU? Because there are so many other implications of shifting a normal baby to neonatal ICU. Now, whether the field engineer can actually tell which was of the two glucometers was right. Now, at 8 p.m. in the evening, he may not even have an access to the manufacturer's uh, engineer or somebody who can really verify. So what can we do about this? Is the challenge that one would see in this kind of a situation. Can I have the next slide, please? So is it possible to isolate the source of the error? Now, in case of glucometer, either it could be the glucometer or the strips which are out of date, or it is the incorrect use due to untrained user. So we thought, why not develop a method which is in-house, which can be used at any time of the day, whether it is uh, evening or middle of the night. Next slide, please. So we developed a method where we developed three dextrose solutions of three different concentrations. And for a given brand of glucometer of a given manufacturer and a set of strips, we developed a full set of data for these three concentrations. So uh, when a clinical engineer encounters a situation which I discussed in the previous uh, slides, he would actually have these three solutions at, at his disposal. And he can immediately go and check the glucometer uh, to find out whether the glucometer and the strips are good or the users were not using it correctly. If the glucometer and the strips are good, then the readings will fall within the plus or minus two standard deviation band, which is shown in this. So one has to really apply mind in terms of making sure that the quality of the equipment is good when it is in clinical use. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, to all, having said all this, the training of clinical staff is one of the very important aspects of uh, clinical engineering. Can I have the next slide, please? So we have been involved in training of clinical staff, either it is operation theater staff or nurses, or we are we brought in company uh, people to keep on training the staff again and again. Next slide, please. So we have been using the medical equipment literature, a key resource is the user manual. And I would like to just highlight that in very early parts of the user manuals, uh, either there is a patient safety paragraph or a patient safety chapter or a precautions chapter. So uh, as clinical engineers, it is one of our duties to go through this manual and transmit this information to the users in the way they would understand to ensure medical equipment safety. Next slide, please. And of course, in terms of use of equipment, correct use of equipment, we uh, also have developed e-learning uh, modules and e-learning methods because 
in terms of size some hospitals are very big and they, we have large number of staff to train so it's a it's a automatic process whereby they can get a repeat training again and again uh, to understand the uh, issues related to medical equipment can i have the next slide please so uh, in summary to uh, have a perspective of quality assurance and safety i would like to highlight few important points in the next slide so the take home message from all this discussion is first of all engage with the clinical staff what is the difference between a biomedical engineer working in a company and clinical engineer working on the field he has good opportunity to engage with the clinical staff so that is important observe with a very keen eye as we have seen we could do it for the three pin club investigate with the scientific mind make sure that you are not doing anything wrong keep the science as the base innovate with simplicity always it is not necessary to have high cost devices implement a cost effective solution and also keep on following up on its effectiveness and whether further modification is required so this is the whole uh, idea of clinical engineering's role in quality and safety and how a clinical engineer can make a major difference in the field uh, can i have the next slide please so a big thank you to global clinical engineering alliance and my hospital and all the colleagues and friends who continue to encourage us and contribute in these efforts to offer safe and quality of care to the patients thank you very much thank you professor kambete and i really really appreciate this other perspective that you brought to the to this webinar i would like to ask also kevin to uh, switch on the, the the webcam we are now yeah a couple of minutes for questions and answers just just a remark on the presentation from uh, niranjan uh, i was very much impressed about uh, the electrical safety examples that you brought that we see worldwide and uh, uh, so many times we dedicate so much effort to kind of sophisticated activities uh, research you know leakage currents in plastic uh, devices battery operated which doesn't doesn't make much sense uh, but then you can have some very simple and effective uh, points to check that uh, probably cover i don't know 90 percent of uh, of the issues so this is really great bringing back to what's core in the activities that absolutely need to be done uh, we have collected a few questions i have noticed a very lively debate about the right to repair going on in the chat thanks to kevin that was answering uh, while while questions arrived so I will, I will would not cover that in the questions and answers because it's back to the chat, but very, very interesting and uh, worth considering for maybe a full webinar dedicated to this uh, to this kind of, of topic. I, I just collected a couple of questions that I'd like to address to the to to, to you. So one question uh, for Dr. Cambete. Uh, have you seen cases of staff or patients actually receiving harmful shocks? due to the lack of proper head bonding in India. So not only spotting the problem, but actually seeing that this is a safety issue. Uh, so yes, uh, I have had anecdotal experiences about uh, patients maybe not receiving direct shock, but maybe experiencing some kind of discomfort. And perhaps that was due to a very minor leakage current flowing into their body. Uh, secondly, of course, sometimes staff do experience these kind of uh, electric shocks. And in fact, I would like to say that we had conducted as a part of awareness campaign, a uh, survey on medical equipment safety from various hospitals across the country. And a outcome of that survey was essentially that electrical equipment sometimes does give shocks. So if we do have a, uh, some data on that, no doubt about it. So, and then a question for both of you, I would like to hear your perspectives uh, with a piece of background. Uh, in my opinion, but it, I think it emerged also from your presentations, a lot of issues with medical devices and medical equipment uh, uh, are often due to misuse or use error from, from the users that is not necessarily neg negligence, but it could be lack of training or uh, being in a hurry or environmental conditions anywhere, so things like this. So there was a question addressed to Keiko, but she's not here. So I would like to address, uh, to address this 
to you. The question was how medical personnel, when required, accept and attend the training for usage and troubleshoot shooting of uh, biomedical uh, equipment. In general, the question that we also face here in Italy or in other countries is, we all know that the user training is very important. How difficult is it? And uh, what's your experience to make it uh, as effective as possible? So Kevin and then uh, Niranjan. So my team routinely get calls on what they call error 12. The, the error occurred 12 inches from the device, uh, which was the user. Uh, and we have, in many cases, especially with the nursing staff and the high number of locums we get up here, changeover staff, we, we find they're fairly receptive to uh, biomedical staff providing training and my staff have the mandate to provide that. And, uh, uh, sometimes we'll go even further and set up more formal training with staff development team on some key devices. Um, I know one of my staff, uh, senior techs, she uh, set up a whole special training on ECGs and the fact that they were uh, not connecting the leads correctly and or the electrodes were, were dried out and they were having issues like that because of the low usage of the electrodes. So we, we, we will routinely get involved in that training and it's usually well received. Okay. If I may uh, also uh, carry on from there, uh, incidentally, we have also developed a training module for nurses on how to record ECG and there are various aspects and uh, we did see the need of that because initially we realized that the nurses were not actually using the correct electro electrode placement. But I think one point uh, is important is that we have to make the training very simplistic the way it is understood by the clinical staff in their language, rather than talking a lot of technical. Second uh, observation that we had is, if we have large number of nurses in a bigger hospital, one tends to train all the nurses through a kind of presentation, maybe 100 at a time. I think that is not very effective. So we thought we would train only a small group of 10 to 15 nurses. And for that, we had to run every day a training session for one hour. And we have to dedicate that much of clinical engineering staff for that. Then we realized, and that is why we went on to e-learning module due to two reasons. One is we would train the nurses in smaller groups, but because of their clinical busy schedule, they would tend to forget things. So we need to do repeat training. Now, already we have a challenge of training large number of nurses. And that is why our strength in technology comes. So we actually as clinical engineers some of them are good in software skills actually uh, got involved into developing an e-learning module and through our hospital's hr software we already uh, implemented an e-learning module for nurses and we can distribute that content uh, over that e-learning portal so we can assign the nurse to go through the training repeatedly once in six months and that would be uh, as a part of their incentive and things like that so that is another important uh, thing. The repeat training is equally important than the first time training. These are some important aspects of training of clinical leaders. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, really. This is some global issue and uh, debate, and also at the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance, especially the training committee, uh, we are discussing this. If it could be useful for the Alliance to address with our training or uh, sensibilization initiative or whatever we can do, uh, not only our own community of uh, clinical and biomedical engineers, but also talk to the users, uh, nurses and physicians. Then, of course, you need to act locally with your pre, pre, small group programs, uh, repeated training and so on. But uh, I think this is a very interesting input for us uh, about the importance to address uh, clinical users in our initiatives, maybe with basic concepts of medical equipment safety, electrical safety and so on. Yes. But this could be really a, a take home message for the Alliance. So thank you. Thank you very much. Now, it's... Uh, 7 p.m. UTC, so we are 
on time to close the, the webinar. A lot of questions, a lot of debate, very interesting presentations. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, the, the slides uh, and the recording will be available at the website that Caliroy, that I really thank for her support, is now showing in these slides uh, that uh, everything is available on our uh, www.globalcea.org uh, website. And, uh, um, yeah, uh, next appointments will be announced uh, on the on the Global Clinical Engineering uh, Alliance uh, Alliance uh, website. So I really wish to thank uh, all the people that attended. We are more than 80 participants that stable during the whole webinar, which is uh, very good. I would like to thank uh, Kevin Taylor for being here, Niranjan Kambete, and of course, uh, our colleague and friend Keiko Fukuta. Big thank you to Kaliroy for her support and uh, uh, to um, Said Khalil for leading the team of uh, the alliance uh, dedicated to training uh, and uh, this uh, collection of, of initiatives. Thank you very, very much. Uh, really appreciated the presentations, the debate and the discussion. And uh, see you all next time uh, with the Global Clinical Engineering Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.